Hello there. My name is Carly Andres. I am the Senior Project Coordinator for the North Dakota Brain Injury Network, and you are viewing, viewing cognitive consequences of brain injury. So um, this is more geared for educators. So um, we are hopefully going to explain to you the cognitive impacts of a brain injury, um, but this is our team here. Rebecca Quinn is our director. Uh, Nikki Livedolin is our resource facilitator, and then we have myself. So we are a small but mighty team. Um, if you ever want to make a referral to us, uh, there is a form um, at ndbin.org on the top right hand corner that says referral. Um, but we will talk about that again as well. But um, here we go. So what is cognition, first of all? So basically, it's our our conscious mental activities. It's very complex. We don't even realize it's happening. We take all of our sensory stuff from the outside world and we transform it, we reduce it, we elaborate it, we recover it, and then we use it. And it all happens very, very quickly. Um, and we don't even usually realize it's happening, but um, there are many different levels of cognition. And so we are going to talk about all of them. So the first level is attention. Attention influences all of the other cognitive skills. So attention is really the basis and it helps us decide how we're going to allocate all of our processing that needs to happen because we don't have unlimited processing resources. So we have to decide what's important and what's not. And our brain does that for us. So there are actually five different types of attention. So let's look at each different type. So the first type is focus. That's the ability to focus on the specific stimulus for any period of time. So this is just a really quick, like, alert, um, turning to a loud noise, looking at a billboard while you're driving, noticing your cold. You're not necessarily doing anything about any of these, but you're noticing it. Okay, so this is pretty brief. Um, sustained attention now is when we maintain that attention over a period of time. So when we read a book or we watch a TV show or we listen to a teacher in class, right? So um, interesting thing, um, I, we ask as an icebreaker in one of the classes that I teach, what is your favorite uh, movie or TV show? Majority of survivors say a TV show and they say one that's very short, that's like a 20 minute sitcom because it's all wrapped up in that 20 minutes, right? Because um, they're able to follow that plot line a lot better than like, let's say a two, three hour movie. Selective attention is when we can pay attention while there's still distractions going on. So the example given here is like this guy is still paying in to attention to the instructor um, at the gym while the other things are in the gym are going on. So this is, um, you know, the kid that can tune out the pencil tapping of the kid next to them in the classroom. Okay. This one is tricky for brain injury. They oftentimes cannot tune out that tapping of that pencil next to them. So they need to learn some strategies on how to ignore all that other stuff and still keep their focus. Uh, alternating attention is shifting between tasks that demand different behavioral or cognitive skills. So when we're talking on the phone and someone comes into the room and interrupts us, um, and then we go back to the phone, we kind of might need a reminder about where we were in the conversation. Someone with brain injuries for sure going to need that reminder about where they were in the conversation. Another example is just reading a recipe and stirring the pot. So you're doing two things at once and they're both, they both demand your cognition and your, and your behavior. Divided attention is basically multitasking. And um, so this can be reading an email while someone's talking surfing the web while watching TV, and you can see this woman is driving and she's talking on the phone and she's drinking her coffee. Uh, multitasking is not good practice for anybody, whether you have a brain injury or not. We really should never be multitasking. Um, one of those things, if when we're doing two things at once, one of those things is kind of is suffering. It's not being done to the level that it could be done at. So we want to kind of avoid divided attention tasks anytime we can for anybody. So what are we going to do about it? These are some interventions, some accommodations we can make, some things we can try. So brain breaks. Um, someone with a brain injury has a very limited attention span, so they need more time to kind of recharge and reset and um, process things. So taking frequent breaks is, is often encouraged. We want to ensure focus before instruction. That looks a lot different for different people, but 
Typically that can look like eye contact and body language, you know, turning to the speaker, following the speaker. Um, we can redirect um, for attention. So if our attention is on that pencil tapper, we can kind of, you know, redirect back to the main idea or the main objective of the lesson. Uh, we want to reduce visual and auditory distractions. So um, for all of you teachers, you know, you that have those busy classrooms with posters all over the place and cute things hanging up, um, think about that. Think about how distracting that is to someone that's attention span is all over the place. So um, I have um, said that to teachers before when I do go out in the field and and observe and things and I'll just net, try to nicely say, you know, we could we could probably take a few things down. Um, and especially if you haven't referred to it in, you know, the last school year, then you probably don't need it up on your wall anymore. Um, vigorous movement to stimulate the brain. We want to make your student with the brain injury your runner, right? We want them to be the one that goes down to the office to get staples or something. And pro tip, you don't necessarily have to need staples, just send them anyway. <laughs> but they do so much better, like let's say before spelling test, if they can get some movement in and then come back and do the spelling test. Um, we want to plan their schedule when concentration time is the greatest. Typically, this is in the morning. So I try to stack my students' schedules that I help out with. So we will put, you know, those rigorous, those hard, those classes that we need to pay attention to, the math, the English, the science. We try to put those at the at the beginning of the day and then try to leave a little bit more, you know, like your music and your your classes that don't necessarily require a lot of, of attention, um, you know, gym class, that kind of thing towards the end of the day. And then we want to try to eliminate interruptions as much as possible. So shutting your classroom door, um, if it's, you know, if you're able to um, maybe put something over the um, the speaker for when they, you know, so-and-so come to the office, that kind of thing. Some of those can be really loud and those can really pull attention away. So if we can even cover it with something just to kind of muffle the sound, I think that helps too. All right, so that's attention. So now we are on to categorization. So categorization is important in that it helps us with our processing speed and our problem solving and our decision making. Um, so it's important to know where certain things fit and why they fit there. Um, as a, a neuropsychologist, so neuropsychologists are who diagnose brain injuries and they basically describe brain injury as like a file cabinet and somebody went into your file cabinet and they messed up all your files. So your categorization might be a little bit off, um, you know, like we might show a gentleman a hammer and say, where does this belong, you know, in your house? And they might say the kitchen, but where does the hammer belong? Probably, you know, in the garage, right? Or with the toolbox. So well, another thing about categorizing, I think of as far as a functional skill or a real world skill would be grocery shopping. So this is an activity that I will often do if we're in a group setting and we're doing a training. I will ask you to tell me like, what order am I gonna put these in in my cart? Okay, so if I hand someone a list like this, they might just do the list in order, right? They might go get the bread, then the ice cream, then the gum, then the peas. They're going to be all over the place. And also their ice cream is going to be melted by the time they find the magazines. Okay, so putting it in an order that makes sense um, to the way that we would shop through our store or that so things aren't, you know, melting and, and stuff like that. So that's an example of a categorization activity. Okay, so uh, moving along, we're on to memory now. So memory impairments can be a difficulty in encoding in the storage or the retrieval of the information. Okay, so encoding is the context that stores that memory. The storage is the stabilization and then the retrieval is kind of the search for it, the pulling it out. So I really like this example. So like I said, um, we have all of our sensory stuff, our hearing, our vision, our taste, touch, and smell that all goes into our sensory memory. Then for a little while, for a few minutes to, out, to a few hours, it'll stay in our short-term memory. And then it kind of is in our working memory as it decides where should it go? Should it go into our long-term? Is this important for me to save and keep forever? Or should it just stay in my short-term where I can forget about it and it doesn't really matter? So um, this gets glitchy after brain injury, though. So oftentimes what we see is that individuals struggle with their short-term memory. 
typically their long-term memories stay intact. Um, and it's those short-term things that they're going to really struggle with. So um, really utilizing strategies for short-term memory. So you can do that by making instruction more manageable. Um, so four or less um, instructions to um, an assignment or a task you're expecting. We want to focus on one concept at a time, kind of that main idea, right? Um, the student with brain injury isn't probably going to pick up on every single idea, but if they know the main idea of the lesson, that's great. Um, we want to do a multi-sensory approach in the way we present our information. So we want it verbally, we want it written, we want to provide visuals, we want to provide models. Any way we can incorporate the senses when we're presenting information is going to help it go into the memory more. We can use WH questions, okay? So who, what, when, where, why, and how as we're reading, as we're having discussions, asking a lot of questions. Questions can really gauge our comprehension and our understanding of things. And you're probably going to be pretty surprised when you ask these questions about the student with of the student of the brain injury. You know, after reading, um, they might not quite have grasped the whole concept, and this will be a really good way to tell. And then finally, I teach you teach that lights up different parts of our brain. When I'm teaching you something, that's one part. When I'm learning something, it's another part. So, um, if we teach them something, now you show me what you just learned, or you, you know, you you tell me. Um, that that's a really helpful strategy for making sure it kind of goes more into that long-term memory. Next stop on our wheel is processing. So that's our time that it takes to gather the information that's being talked about, to process it and respond to it. This is very glitchy after brain injury. We don't really know why, but there is a glitch with processing speed and many individuals um, with brain injury require um, extra wait time. So I am someone that kind of likes to fill silence and I don't really like that awkward silence. And so I tend to talk and feed answers or, you know, kind of keep talking and probably confusing them. So since my time at the brain injury network, I've had to learn how to not do that anymore. And so what I do for myself, if I'm waiting on a client to answer, I usually just kind of count in my own head. And I have some clients that I get all the way to like 30 with, but others that, you know, maybe 10 or 15 but just allowing that response time. They often know how to answer the question. It just takes them a while to gather the response. Um, but some other things we can do about processing, we can pre-process and post-process recap. So as far as the school setting, you know, before a lesson, if it's possible, if you can give that student a little bit of a, okay, we're, today in math, we're gonna talk about fractions. There's going to be, you know, we're going to talk about the word numerator and the word denominator. And I want you to listen for those words throughout our lesson today. Okay. Now, after the lesson, you can do a post-process. All right. What did we talk about today and now? Hopefully they say fractions. Did you come up with any, you know, did you hear any words that I used that I told you about before we talked about it? Hopefully they come up with maybe numerator and denominator, you know, those kinds of things. Um, we want to allow for that delay, so I kind of explained how I do that myself. Um, I count, but you can do it however you would like. We want to be brief and concise, so just getting wordy, um, you know, gets, gets complicated, and it's just too much language and too much thinking time, so we want to just be very brief and concise. Please, please, please provide copies of notes and outlines when you can. That helps our students so much more. You are not like giving them the answers if you give them your notes. And if you're worried about that, then take out a few words here and there and have them fill in the blank. That's the kind of notes I prefer personally is ones with some fill in the blank so that they're not given that free pass, right, to just kind of hang out. Uh, but they, they still need to listen. Um, we want to give instructions one step at a time when possible. We, we're probably going to need to repeat directions multiple times. Uh, and then allow for recording of lecture if, if able. Um, and a lot of students I know use smart pens these days, and that does record um, different segments of the lecture. So allowing that in your classroom would be great. Okay, we're moving along here. So now we are on to our executive functions. These are the cognitive directors. So they assist in the interaction between the other cognitive processes. So memory, attention, and perception. So this is our adulting skills, I usually say. These are, this is our reasoning, our planning, our judgment, our initiation, all that good stuff is in our executive functioning skills. 
and those are not done developing until for females it's about 20 um five years of age and males it's about 26 years of age so i mean they the students you're working with aren't even close to being done with that and that's why they're making those i'm doing it in quotes great decisions that they make right that's um why i know i remember when i taught middle school the principal opened up one of our our you know time together our professional development days with a picture of a young man with his head between a chair you know um between like the slats of a chair and he couldn't get it off you know it's that whole thinking ahead like okay if i put this chair on am i going to be able to get it off they don't do that at that age that's that's just their frontal lobe is not developed yet and that's where all that is stored right here in that frontal lobe so um so some strategies so there's a lot of strategies because there's so many different areas so initiation is one of the executive functioning skills so to get started on tasks we can have the student visualize it so picture them you know writing their paper or doing their poster board they can verbalize it and talk about it and then start the task but like thinking about it and talking it out first so kind of almost that pre-process post-process idea we want to provide Frequent check-ins. Um, these students are pretty good at saving face. They're pretty good at smiling and nodding and acting like everything's okay. So really asking again those comprehension questions and checking in to see where they're at. Um, my example of this is I had a young lady that um, was in the classroom and they were supposed to be working on like um, like a portal area where they had to log in and watch these life skills videos. And she could not get her password to go through and so rather than raise her hand and ask for help she sat there and she just kept typing in the same thing and hitting send and it was telling her no you know incorrect 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 and she never once asked for help and literally 30 to 45 minutes went by and the teacher was at her desk the entire time so please circulate and make sure kids are doing what they're supposed to um a lot of these kids at this age don't have those self-help skills and they need you to um, check in on them. So please circulate often. It might seem like everybody's going with the flow, but maybe not everybody is. We want to use if then interventions. So that's, you know, if you do five math problems, you can have, you know, two minutes of iPad or a drink of water, whatever the incentive of the carrot for that student is. Um, It'll take a while to figure that out, but usually the if nuns work pretty slick. Um, we want to teach planner use. Again, we want to teach planner use. We cannot just hand out planners. Um, that is one thing I got a little frustrated with in again in the middle school setting is they give everyone a planner, right? But many, you know, some teachers were really good at it, but not too many would teach how to use it. We can't expect them to know what to do with that planner. They need to be taught. Um, and it is 2023, so maybe not everybody likes paper and pencil planner. We might need to teach a calendar app on a phone, things like that. And then we want to teach self-advocacy skills, because like I said, that girl that sat there and just kept typing the same password in and never asking for help, she lost a lot of time by doing that, right? So teaching her when to know to raise your hand and ask for help. Um, planning, we want to use graphic organizers. We want to teach time management. My example for that, I have you know, a young lady that loves to write in cursive, and it's beautiful, gorgeous cursive, but it takes her a very long time. It's very, you know, laborious her for um, her cursive. And so to teach her time management, we, sh we had her write the same sentence once in cursive, and we timed it. And then we had her write it in print and timed it. And it was a significant time difference. And so that kind of showed her. And then we just kind of kept doing that. And she now will mostly write um, in print. So it kind of helps with that one. We need to treat, to learn how to problem solve. Um, problem solving needs to be explicitly taught to this population. So we have to first figure out what is the problem. They're maybe not even aware that there is a problem going on. Um, we want to consider the relevant information. Like, why is this happening? Think of the solutions and list them out. Give a visual. And then create a plan and, and an action plan. How are we going to solve this problem? Okay. Uh, some other strategies. Organization. We want a daily routine. Routine, routine, routine. When our brain knows what's coming next, it does phenomenal. 
Um, we want to use a check-in, check-out system for assignments and materials. Um, those work really slick. We had them when I taught to in the middle school setting. Um, they were like the carbon copy type paper. So there was, you know, three copies. Um, one stayed with the students, um, like homeroom teacher. One, one went home with mom and dad, and then the student got to keep one, I believe, was how it worked with three. Um, but um, but basically, it, you know, they when they came into class, the teacher checked to make sure they had their assignment and materials and they either checked a box or didn't check a box if they didn't. Um, I'm not going to read through spell it out for you. I'll let you read that one or Google that one on your own. Uh, mental flexibility. So again, if we can have routines, we know what's coming next. We also want to warn and time for transition. So in five minutes, we're going to gym class. In two minutes, we're going to lunch. Whatever it is that you're doing, try to give warnings. If you can set a timer, I personally love those time timer ones that kind of show you with the red. So they're they're a black clock with, it has red for how much time is left and you can see it gets smaller and smaller. Um, we wanna provide choices of two appropriate options. So let's say, you know, we got a student that's like, I'm not doing this worksheet. Do you wanna do it with a blue pen or a black pen? or you know, uh, something where they're still gonna do it, but they have a little bit of control over how they do it. Um, and then we also need to teach coping strategies. Um, this is something we, all humans can benefit from, right? Belly breathing, breathing deep down into our belly, practicing mindfulness, um, learning how to calm yourself by talking positively to yourself. There's all kinds of things and um, it's gonna vary what works from student to student, but um, we really need to work on teaching those coping strategies. Our reasoning, we wanna give consistent neutral feedback, avoid sarcasm. This uh, kiddos, sarcasm goes right over their head. Multiple choice rather than open-ended questions are gonna be really helpful for this population. Um, open-ended questions, it's just, there's too many things for them to think of. Um, whereas uh, multiple choice, much easier to narrow down the correct answer. Um, so that one gets a little long, but basically it's saying that the more structure we provide, the more likely they are to be compliant and to do what you would like them to do. So it's those unstructured times or those times when those are, when individuals are tired, when they're more likely to be defiant, irritable, resistant, and that kind of thing. Um, as far as social emotional, we want to have a calm down area if we can, a space in our classroom or in, you know, the building where we can go chill out if we need to, uh, counting backwards, deep breathing, relaxation, and visualization. Visualization can be like, you know, imagine yourself next to a, a sparkling brook in the springtime and, you know, hearing the birds and hearing the brook bubbling and hearing all of that and kind of imagining yourself there can, can kind of help calm you down. So interventions in general, we want to have the individual lead whenever possible. Um, try to give subtle hints. Um, typically with brain injury, that student knew themselves before and they were probably typical before. And so they might not even realize they're struggling with something, but you can kind of help them, you know, I've noticed you struggle with remembering your lunch number every day. Should we practice your lunch number more? you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then strength-based interventions um, are gonna go a long, long way. Individuals with brain injury do not respond well to negative reinforcement and they they really need you to play up their positive strengths and they need to feel like they were successful, just like all of us, right? Um, but yeah, if we can try, you know, to determine an area of weakness before we do an intervention, that can go a long way too to see which would be the best intervention to implement. So last stop on the wheel, metacognition. That is our highest order. That is basically how we think about thinking. Okay, so metacognition and executive function are very similar, but they're not the same. They just kind of rely on each other. So they might be aware of struggles they're having. So they might know like, yes, I can't remember my lunch number, but they might not know how to fix it. How can I remember my lunch number? So they might need you to help them, you know, remember to practice it and um, have it written down for them in multiple spots and that kind of thing. 
So after brain injury, there's a really tricky thing called awareness. Um, awareness is huge. Um, individuals are not always aware of their own deficits. There is um, an acceptance piece. So they need to understand the significance of those deficits. So maybe lunch number is not the greatest, um, but phone number, how about that? So if we don't know our phone number, that's a pretty big deal if we get like, let's say lost in a mall or something and we can't, you know, find mom or dad and we need to call them. We don't know their number. That's going to be a problem. Um, so they need to, to learn, uh, you know, understand the significance of that memory loss or whatever the, you know, ailment might be. And then we need to make changes in the behavior response. So we, we need to adjust things. And typically what we would love to see, and I, I like this image better, same concept, but just the visual. So when we look at awareness, there's different stages of it. And there's intellectual, emergent, and anticipatory. When someone reaches anticipatory, they are at full acceptance and you can really implement adjustments and accommodations well when they aren't there you're going to have more struggles with implementing those accommodations because they're going to think they don't need them right so intellectual awareness for someone with a brain injury might be like oh i forgot your name you know so just asking hey what's your name that's intellectual emergent awareness is kind of like oh i have a brain injury and i always forget people's names what's your name okay so they know it's because of the brain injury that they forget now, what we really want to see is that anticipatory. We want them to say, oh, I have a brain injury and I always forget stuff. I better write your name down so that next time I'll remember it. So we want them to anticipate that they will forget and have a strategy in place. You know, whether it's writing it in their phone or taking a picture of that person or whatever it might be. Um, but we want them to think about that. I got to see this in the classroom in action once and it was pretty exciting. Um, so the teacher was giving information on uh, the next week at school. It was going to be a shortened week. Thursday and Friday, there was no school. And so my student knew that or knew that she would forget. So she got up and she grabbed a post-it note off the teacher's desk and she wrote down no school Thursday, Friday, and she put the dates and she stuck it in her pocket. And I was so excited to see that. They leased out. I don't know if that post-it note made it where it was supposed to go. But she's showing that anticipatory. She knows she would forget. So she's she's helping to accommodate for herself. I find this slide very, very important. And I preach this all the time. People need visuals. We learn, and this is just any person. This is not necessarily brain injury specific. But everyone, we learn most of what we learn through our sight, through our vision. So think of how often teachers lecture, right? And so with a lecture, if you don't have like PowerPoint slides, a lot of that's going right over our heads. Um, so we really need to provide some type of visual um, when we can and try to incorporate as many as those senses as possible. Here's just kind of some examples and I'm sorry they didn't, um, transfer super nicely into PowerPoint, but these are kind of some of the things I will recommend and I will make for clients. Um, so these are to provide structure and routine for this young man, um, or this, he's not young, he's a young adult living on his own. But um, so basically the staff in the morning circle what day it is, and then he, you know, make your bed now, circle yes, brush your teeth, circle yes, yeah. you know, so you kind of go through all the things that you do in the day. Um, and then this would be an example of this shopping list so that the categorization is already done for him. So now when he's putting, you know, when he's out of ketchup, he's going to put it in condiments. And when he wants more, you know, Mountain Dew, he's going to put it under beverages. So it just kind of helps him when he goes to the store um, shop a little bit more in a way that makes sense. And then finally, my last tip as far as helping with cognition is to use social stories. Um, social stories are used a lot with individuals on the autism spectrum, um, but there is a lot of research um, that they're good for brain injury too. They're, they're good for all humans, really. It's good for kids when they know what's coming next. And I mean, I know this isn't, we don't know absolutely what's coming next, but we can make a, a best guess. And so um, big things about social stories is they should be written in third person, right? Um, and um, 
we should read them multiple times before going into the activity. I personally like to use them in my classroom for like fire drills because I usually, being I taught um, intellectual disabilities, um, the principal usually gave me a heads up that a fire drill was going to be happening on that day so we wouldn't be like in the middle of the bathroom or something like that with a student. And so then those kiddos that I knew that this was going to bother, we would read through social stories, you know, in five minutes, the fire alarm is going to go off. It's going to be loud. You are, you can cover your ears or, you know, so-and-so can cover their ears, you know, so we're writing it in third person again. But if you need some help with that or some ideas on social stories, uh, let me know. But I, I've seen social stories on everything from masturbation to fire drills. So you can do them on literally any topic that you would want um, that you seem to be having struggles with. So um, that is all for cognition today. Um, thanks for listening, and we hope to see you at the next recording. Thanks. Bye.